Let me know when I can start. Yeah, yeah? great. Okay. Good evening. I'm Joe Auslander from the retired from the University of Maryland, together with Michael Pearson, the organizer of this event, the Legacy of the Lord. I just have a few remarks and, and before I let the speakers go. But I first heard of Lee Lorch when I was a, a student in New York in the late 1940s. I was not at City College where Lee taught, but I had many friends there. And there were a number of students uh, there who later became distinguished mathematicians. Uh, I wanted to contact them, but most of them are no longer living. Lee outlived most of them, anyway. Uh, but they include Alan Shields, Harold Shapiro, DJ Newman, uh, Martin Davis, Jack Schwartz, Leon Aaron Price, they're probably others, former students at City. And many of these credited Lee with their early mathematical development. But in addition to Lee's outstanding teaching in mathematics, which we'll hear more about uh, from one of the speakers, Lee became famous for his uh, uh, civil rights work. Um, I'll mention two, two that are well known. One was his, his subletting, he and his wife Grace subletting in their apartment in Stuyvesant Town, which was owned by the Metropolitan Life Insurance uh, for a, uh, uh, to, to an African American family. And as a reward for this, Lee was fired from City College and then Penn State. And, it, 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 and he covered the succession of predominantly uh, historically black colleges. And in particular, he and his wife Grace were famous in Little Rock, Little Rock Arkansas, uh, for escorting black students to school. And, uh, the school to be, be segregated. And I got to know, know Lee personally in the 1960s at various AM match meetings. We worked together in, in what was called MAG, the Mathematics Action Group, which was a, a dissident organization in the mathematical community. We started out by mobilizing mathematicians in opposition to the Vietnam War, and then uh, we ended up democratizing uh, the various mathematical organizations. We had some successes in that. Anyway, our emphasis tonight, as its title indicates, is a blend of mathematics and activism, as exemplified by Lee. Of course, we'll remember Lee and his accomplishments, including but not restricted to his legendary work in, in mentoring, encouraging African American students and mathematicians. But in referring to Lee's legacy, we want to emphasize what still needs to be done, combining it into mathematics and social justice. Uh, now, uh, Michael, uh, on behalf of MA, has a few remarks. Primarily, thank you, Joe. Primarily, I just want to welcome you here and say how pleased I am personally at, uh, to be hope that we can host this event this evening. Um, the issues that Lee fought so hard for in his life remain uh, of central importance, I think, to our community. And in fact, uh, in some some ways, in uh, recent years, one could uh, make an argument that we have not made much progress uh, in some legal time. And so it behooves all of us to reconsider uh, and recommit to, to some of those, uh, to some of these efforts. So I'm real pleased that we can be a part of this tonight. Um, I, I, when we were thinking about this, this event, and it, um, we were, of course, reminded of, of Lee's many um, accomplishments. And the MAA, in fact, recognized Lee in 2007 with the uh, Gung Fu Award for Distinguished Service, our highest award for service to the mathematical sciences community. And so I did just want to uh, read just a bit from the citation uh, from that award. So throughout his career, Dr. Borch has been a vocal advocate and energetic worker for human rights and educational opportunities. He advocated policies to ensure access by all mathematicians to official activities at meetings of the AMS and MAA. His advocacy has led to greater participation by women and minorities in these organizations. And I think that's absolutely true. And again, we're glad to be here tonight. And Joe, I will return it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Jim Donaldson. Uh, uh, professor Howard University, an old friend of me. Good 
Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm glad to see that so many of you turn out to honor uh, someone who has done so much uh, in this country in a number of arenas. And what I shall try to limit my few remarks to tonight, and I say few, uh, because I was told that I had 15 minutes, and whatever I said, gave it said, I end 15 minutes. So what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to do uh, what I always I ask others to do. If someone has said something, but didn't quite say it as well as you would have said, please refrain from resaying. <laughs> All right? And so that's what I'm going to try to do. So that would save me some time. Because many of the things that I had hoped to say have been said, you know, already in the introductory uh, remarks. Now, I'd like for you to just, for just, for just a moment, you know, let's think about what this year uh, represents. About 60 years ago, when I, myself, was in high school, I believe, or just barely in high school, the Board versus Education passed. Uh, it was made law by decision of the Supreme Court. Now that was an enormous event in my little area you know, of the world. First of all, they tried to prevent me from even hearing about it. Uh, any folks like myself from hearing about it. Because we didn't live in a large metropolitan area like Washington, D.C. In fact, many of us didn't even live in a small little place. Myself, I lived on a farm. And that was a, a momentous uh, occasion because many people had trouble uh, to make sure that people from underrepresented groups, mainly now I'm speaking of black people, you know, got the opportunity, you know, for a real uh, education. And that was supposed to have been the beginning. I No, no I said supposed to have been the beginning. And for the next 10 years, there was a real struggle. And then the monumental Civil Rights Act of 1964, to that July 15th, I believe was when it was signed by President Lyndon Johnson, uh, really changed things. The Civil Rights, Act, Civil Rights Act of 1964 really changed things for a lot of us. Now, this was possible because there were thousands of people you know, who made real sacrifices. And when I say sacrifice, I mean sacrifice to make this happen. One of those persons who would have to be at the top of anyone's list would be my friend, Lee Lloyd, that we have here. Now, now I never knew who did like this. I never really knew him. In fact, this picture probably was taken before I was born. But, but anyway, it's a nice picture. It's a nice picture. So let us go to the end of his life, near the end of his life. This was uh, last year. Uh, now I got word uh, last spring they look, you need to come to Toronto uh, because Lee is not as strong as he has been. I had seen him about four years earlier. Uh, I had gone up to Toronto to visit with him, uh, and he was living at then in sort of like an assisted living place, but he had moved to a more a facility that provided even more care when I got there. 
And I had been told that he was not recognizing many people. And I can't really say that he recognized me. Maybe he recognized a voice in some of my bad jokes. But, but he did perk up, you know, while I was there. And I was really happy that I had the opportunity uh, to meet him uh, on that occasion. Now, now, many of us, you know, talk about his non-mathematical work that he has done. Not much is said about his mathematical work. But I wanted to just say in the few minutes that I have left uh, that he was truly a strong mathematician. Now his area was in uh, differential equations, uh, generally analysis, but with concentration of special functions and properties of solutions of those, of those equations. Now I'm just going to just uh, list a few of his papers, and I, I'm listing those because uh, they have a special meaning uh, here. Uh, the first paper listed here was in 1944. Having received his degree in 1941, his doctorate in 1941 at the University of Cincinnati, uh, he took a job for a while working for what is now the National Aeronautical and Space Administration as an assistant mathematician. This paper came out in 1944, but I think by that time he had already decided that it was not right for him to have a safe, cushy job at the time that the nation uh, was under attack. In fact, the whole world was about to really go, and please excuse my uh, words here, was about to go to hell. And he did his share returning about three years uh, later. Uh, you already heard about his activities uh, at uh, City College, about some of his students there uh, and, and the like. So that was his first paper. Now, this, the paper listed here, the second paper, on the, on the first positive zeros of cylinder functions and of their derivatives, which appeared in the Advances in Analysis in 2005, was his last sole paper, the last paper he wrote by himself. Okay, but his very last paper was co-authored. Uh, and this is the one that I list here. This was with his student, uh, Martin E. Muldoon. Now, I had hoped that Muldoon uh, would have been here tonight because Muldoon would, would have been the person to really tell you, you know, what Lee has done, about the technical you know, aspects of it. But I can just tell you that these papers were published in some of the leading journals that the mathematics profession you know, has to offer. Uh, Acta Mathematica is one that an early paper appeared in. In fact, I think he may have had two you know, articles you know, there. Uh, you know, the different journals of the Mathematical Association, the American Mathematical Society, that Joe, keep my time. Keep your time. It's getting there. Okay, all right. Then. Okay, well, let me let, let me uh, let me uh, uh, speed this up a notch. Lee was my friend, uh, and it's hard to sort of let go, you know, of a good strong friend. But not only was he my friend, just as an individual, he was a friend to many of us. And his contribution to the mathematics department and to Howard University at the time uh, we were trying to move from master's degree graduate work to doctoral work uh, was really 
very much, you know, appreciated. I can remember the times he would come uh, to the university and he would meet and he would stay. Uh, good thing, you know, that uh, he had a lot of energy, you know, you know, at the time and would just go and go. He would visit our library and, and I was just sort of amazed at his energy and reading all those newspapers. Uh, when I say all of those newspapers, I think he would read it at least the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, and sometimes when he could get the Daily Worker, he would add that too. <laughs> and uh, he was a uh, uh, he was just really filled with energy. He had all kinds of stories to tell. He was a fantastic teacher. He worked with the students, worked with the junior faculty. He was just an all-around good, good uh, uh, member of the department. And we viewed him as a member of the department. Now, at the time that he died, uh, which was the last day of February, which is called uh, African American History Month, the last week, the last day of February. Uh, at the next meeting of the department, there was a tribute made to him. Although he had been honored before uh, in the department, uh, the faculty of the department, you know, uh, paused to reflect upon what he had done for the mathematics department, you know, uh, at Howard. Now you can hear the same thing about Fisk University. Similar kind of stories can be told uh, by Phil Landon Smith. And I dare say, uh, when you look at his contributions, you can go across the border to the University of Alberta and his contributions uh, at uh, York University, where he uh, retired. So, uh, not wanting to go on, although I'm really just getting started, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would like to just end here by saying. Uh, that the mathematics profession and uh, the United States and this nation and the world is better that this man, unlike some of the folks who came before us, stood up for principles and he fought uh, the good fight. And we, I shall remember him uh, as someone uh, who fought when he didn't have to. Uh, he was people's friends who had no friends. And he just helped uh, so many uh, people. Now, I had a few other slides I wanted to show. If we could just run through them quickly, I'd like to see just a comment about it. Uh, when he came to Howard, uh, he usually occupied my office, which is located in this building, which is the headquarters of the College of Arts and Sciences at Howard University. Now, for about 12 and a half years, I tore uh, my search uh, down on the first floor while I was trying to do administrative work. Move on, please, next one. This is where Lee would go uh, to do his mathematics, and he usually did some mathematics almost every day when he was, when he was, at, he was at Howard. And also in the reading room, there would be located uh, newspapers from throughout the world, and you could find him there many times. Next slide, please. This is the former president of, Jane, uh, of Howard University, James Cheek, and I want to put his name there because James Cheek knew Lee was coming and he approved of it and made it possible that we could continue that 
relationship while we were, work, we were developing uh, the PhD program on a long-term basis. And then, then after the program got underway, uh, uh, Lee would be a regular visitor uh, at you know, Howard uh, University. And so I like that to see in here, but there are many other things I would wanted to say. I would want to say things about NAM, about our trips to uh, uh, West Africa to attend the International Congress at Kamasi, our struggles with the American Mathematical Society in trying to make sure that their black members of the society were treated with dignity and respect. And so I'd like to just end on that. Thank you. Jim, by the way, uh, questions I, now or questions after? What? Question now, I am. No, I think maybe we'll, I might be able to have the speakers okay. and then All the right. questions after. Okay. Uh, 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 Jim mentioned Martin Muldoon, who sent me some material on, on Lee's mathematics, and uh, I, you know, later if someone wants to give me their email, I can, uh, I, I can, I can get, uh, I get it to you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Mary Gray of American University, who is also another friend of mine and a friend of Lee's, who, who uh, uh, also is as well here as a founder of the American Mathematics. Mary. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I don't have any pictures, so you'll just have to look at me the whole time. Um, what can I add to the tributes that have come to Lee uh, here and elsewhere? Well, what I most remember is that I never felt I was doing enough for the causes that Lee supported, uh, whether social justice or, I was going to say, or anti-war, but that's really a so social justice cause as well. I met Lee through MAG, uh, which Jim has already mentioned, Mathematics Action Group. Uh, and in that group, as in many mathematics groups at the time, there were very few women. And although my activism dated back to graduate school days, and the mundane issue, believe it or not, of carry out boys at the grocery stores in Lawrence, Kansas. Now, you might have thought I was worried that carry out boys were boys, but I was so naive that it didn't even occur to me that they should have been having carry out girls. The real problem, the civil rights problem, was that they refused to hire carry out boys from the local Haskell Institute, which was for Native Americans. So that's how I got started. Uh, when I and a few others decided that uh, some action was needed on the subject of girls and women in mathematics, uh, and not necessarily in carrying out groceries, uh, when, we, when that was called for, Lee was with us all the way. We give him credit as one of the founders of the Association for Women in Mathematics. And it's for women in mathematics, partly because of Lee, rather than the Association of Women of Mathematics. So we soon realized that uh, we did have male members. It's about 13% of the members now of AWM are men. Uh, back in the early days, almost all of the African American members were women who had been students of Lee. So they populated the early membership very heavily, and we were very grateful that Lee had introduced so many good people to mathematics. Certainly there were, there were women of color getting PhDs in math before Lee came on the scene, but he was the inspiration for generations, for those who found that they too could be mathematicians. Most importantly, the rest of the mathematical community eventually came around to the notion that women from all kinds of backgrounds could be mathematicians. I'm so sorry that Lee didn't see the first award of a Fields Medal to a woman mathematician. Now, I'm very proud of my students, of whom there are several here today. There's Elaine Smith, and there's Linda Hayden, and there's Flori Fascinelli. And my hope that some of my passion for social justice has been passed on to my students, and it seems to have, judging by their accomplishments, which are many. The mathematicians should realize that mathematics should open its doors to everyone was not an idea, however, that in the early days, and probably not even today, concerned the consul of the American Mathematical Society. So I decided I would attend the meeting. And I know some of you have heard this story before, but I like it, so I tell it anyway. So I was stopped at the door of the consul meeting 
by the current president of the American Mathematical Society, who told me that council meetings were only open to members of the council. And I said, well, I'd read the bylaws. This was even before I became a lawyer. I was going to read my reading bylaws. And I said, no, the bylaws say that it's open to everyone. Oh, said the president, it's a gentleman's agreement that it's only open to members of the council. So I said, I'm no gentleman, and I took my seat and stuck around. And that opened, that opened council meetings to everybody. Now, I'm not sure that when they found out how boring sometimes it could be that anyone was grateful for that, but nonetheless, they were open. The only real excitement that I can remember at the Council of American Math Society was Jim and I and Lee um, creating an enormous fuss about not recognizing the uh, reciprocity agreement with the South African Mathematical Society because of the policies that they had. And I'm glad to say that the South African Math Society has totally reformed. I'm not so sure about the American Math Society, but at least the South Africans have come around. Uh, of course, the, the fact that we had openness in the AMS uh, made us feel better about the AMS. The AMS finally got around finally got around to uh, naming both Lee and me as fellows of the American Mathematical Society. So at least that was some, some recognition that I think probably wouldn't have happened before uh, some of the hard work that Lee did. In the early days, AWM struggled for recognition and for respect. Several times a group of male mathematicians decided that they would come to a meeting and try to disrupt things or to ridicule the speakers. And Lee was a stalwart in, in helping us to turn back su such challenges. And today, AWM advance each year among the, are among the most successful at the joint mathematics meeting and also at the SIAM math meeting. Another aspect of Lee's support was his encyclopedic knowledge of women math mathematicians around the world. Whenever we sought a speaker for an AWM event at the International Council of Mathematics, all we had to do was ask Lee. No matter what country we were looking for a mathematician, he knew someone. One of his causes, as a matter of fact, was the disparate ad adverse treatment of women scientists in the German Democratic Republic when it became unified to one Germany. Not all women fared as well as Chancellor Mer Merkel, who was also a scientist in East Germany. So Lee was concerned. And we did what we could. Not to say that everywhere, everywhere else is uh, better than the United States with respect to how it treats minorities. Uh, one of the things that Lee was always urging me and other people to do was go to Cuba and talk to the mathematicians in Cuba. So I went to Cuba, uh, contrary to Treasury regulations and a few other things at the time. But when I got to Cuba and I was speaking at a, at a meeting of the Math Society of Cuba, I looked out to the, in the audience and I thought, what would Lee say? And what I said was, where are the black mathematicians? There are lots of black people in Cuba, but there were only one or two in this quite sizable audience. And there were also not very many women. So at least I, I felt good about it. I had done what Lee had asked. I had gone to Cuba, but I had also made a fuss. Unfortunately, I didn't end up getting thrown out of the meeting or thrown out of Cuba or getting arrested coming back into the United States. Many of us have been touched by Lee continue to work in some small way for what he believed in. I gave up on mathematics in part because of constant, constant um, exclusivity of mathematicians. Now I use my statistical knowledge and my legal knowledge to do what I can in the causes that we really cared about. Currently I'm conducting a project, project around the disparate effect of voter ID laws. And if anybody wants to help, please let me know. I'm also working with the Sri Lankan Human Rights Group uh, in connection with the American Association for Advancement of Science, scientists on call project, and with an NGO in India on an agricultural project through Statisticians Without Borders. And I still serve for the, as the legal counsel for the Association of Women in Mathematics. But it's not enough. Were Lee around, he would be pushing me to do more. Now, I want to finish by reading a statement that uh, has been sent by Chandler Davis. For those of you who know who Chandler Davis is, the other, other person who certainly inspired me by working on the causes that I care about. So this is, this is a statement that I'll read. I think I still have time left. Joe Hill was executed in 1915, the year Lee Lorch was born. 
all the next century, his life as a labor organizer and his death by firing squad in a frame-up was part of the tradition. We all knew by heart the song Paul Robeson and Pete Seeger loved to sing. The copper bosses killed you, Joe. They shot you, Joe says. Before his execution, Joe Hill wrote, don't waste any time in mourning. Organize. That became part of our tradition, too. Let's keep that spirit alive today. Don't mourn for Lee. Organize. We are living in Lee's future now. We can't follow in his footsteps, but he's already been there. What we can do is to follow where he know his footsteps would have gone. During his lifetime, there had not yet been a shooting death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. We can be as eager as Lee would have been to respond to the racism and the over-militarized police forces, some of them Israeli trained. During Lee's lifetime, while the Gaza trip was held as an unusually harsh million prisoner prison camp by Israel, they did not yet suffer the cruel bombardment of the so-called Operation Protective Edge. We can be frustrated with Lee at the difficulty of finding a way toward justice when the aggressor has practically all the arms and enjoys at least the nominal support of all 100 U.S. senators. It may seem that I am calling for hopeless struggles. Maybe I think that as Joe Hill was a martyr to the workers' struggle, Lee would want his loyal friends and followers to be martyrs. No, as those of us who knew him can well testify, Lee didn't mind winning a couple now and then. Here's one he can win. We can win. A simple demand. No arms to or from Israel while the occupation continues. Arms trade with Israel in both directions brutalizes the underdog on both continents. Closing the Pentagon Palau fuel rate is within reach. The president might even support it, but only if firmly fought it. Let's win this one in Lee's memory. That's from Chapman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, Michael will introduce our next speaker who's coming remotely. Yep. Yep. Well, thanks again. And um, uh, Mary, thanks for talking a little bit about Lee's role in founding AWM. Some of you may have read in a recent newsletter of AWM an interview with Evelyn Boyd Granville, who was also a, a friend of Lee's. And in fact, it, I was reminded. Uh, of another story that we looked up, and it was um, Evelyn. By the way, is is in the D.C. area now. She lives in an assisted living facility um, in out just in the metro area in, in Virginia. And she uh, was sorry she couldn't come tonight. She she did uh, acknowledge the invitation. I sent her a special invitation um, and said that uh, she does send her wishes, but. Uh, uh, she, she wasn't able to, to get out to come. But uh, it, she was a colleague of Lee's at Fisk, and in 1951, uh, Lee and Evelyn and a couple of her colleagues, uh, a couple of their colleagues, did try to integrate the uh, Southeast Section meeting of the, of the MAA, I'm sorry to say, but that's what it was, and, and were denied. But again, uh, the, the results of, of their pushing on the organization has led uh, the AMS, as Mary pointed out, as well as the MAA, to do a lot more to try to encourage uh, and, and accept, well, first accept, and now encourage the participation of women and minorities in our community. So that's a very important thing. Now, as Joe said at the first, we also want to, what we do want to think about, what, what are the challenges that we still face and what are the things that, that uh, uh, we should be doing to continue this struggle? And Linda Braddy is Deputy Executive Director of the MAA, my colleague. And uh, she is in Pittsburgh tonight. She was giving a talk uh, uh, this afternoon. But she, I, I asked her if she would speak to issues around uh, inclusion and broadening participation. And she agreed to do so remotely, so we've got her set up, as you can see on the screen. And we hope all the technology is going to work right for that to work. Hi, Linda. Hi, Michael. Uh, so in any case, without further ado, Linda Braddy. 
Well, it's really um, exciting to be able to do this. This is kind of a new venture for us in terms of the technology. We thought we would try it out. Um, so um, it's actually great to uh, be on the panel with James and Mary. Um, I didn't actually know Lee personally, but um, I feel privileged to, to have the opportunity to carry on his legacy, um, even though I didn't know him. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, so you can see my PowerPoint and I won't be able to see you and so what I would really like to be able to do is see you raise your hands. I'm gonna kind of um, right off at the beginning I'm gonna give you a, like a pop quiz so what I need you to do the answers are gonna be yes or no so I just need you to kinda yell those out so I can hear you okay you can just all answer at once. Um, so let's see Whoops. I better use my down arrow. Okay, so I just wanted to say um, um, that, well, I guess I already said I didn't know Lee Lorch, but it's thanks to him that so much progress, uh, him and people like him, that so much progress has been made. Um, but as Michael already talked about, there's a lot that still needs to be done, and I think that that's not um, necessarily acknowledged by everybody. Some people don't really uh, agree necessarily that there are still gender issues and there are still racial racial issues that need to be addressed. Um, and so there's one particular sort of um, catchphrase that you hear a lot in the media called the gender gap. Um, and so that has to do with you know men and women. There are, for example, there are um, when you look at the number of women who are actually CEOs of corporations. Um, there aren't nearly the percentage that there should be when you look at the breakdown in the workforce. And then there's the salary gap um, as far as women doing the same kind of work as men but not being paid the same amount of money and that sort of thing. Um, and then there in education we have something that's kind of a catchphrase called the achievement gap um, that's based on there are gender issues but particularly I've heard a lot about racial issues. For instance, um, um, African American males are the lowest achieving subgroup in higher ed um, and American Indian students um, drop out at a higher percentage rate than any other um, race or ethnic group. Um, so there are issues that have to do with race and gender in, in higher ed. Um, our calculus project um, that David Brasseau, um heads up, there is some research, uh, some data that they have that shows that our calculus courses actually disproportionately wash out women and minority males. And so that's still, oh, whoops, you're not seeing my slides. Okay, I, sorry, let me go back and make sure I shared my screen. So I shared my entire screen. Okay. Um, you open PowerPoint. Okay, Laura, is it working now? Yep. Yeah. Now you go oh, full screen. Okay, good. Sorry about that. I did something wrong on my end. That was not Laura. That was my fault. <laughs> um, okay, so um, so that's just a little bit of research from higher education about the this achievement gap and and differences that are due to to gender and, and race. Um, so again, much remains to be done. I think one of the keys is awareness. Um, you and I need to help our peers become more aware of social justice issues. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are, are well-meaning, they're not malicious, um, they just really aren't aware that, that these problems are still there. They sort of think, oh, well, all these problems have been solved. Um, so here's the pop quiz, and so I want to get you guys involved, and this is one of those um, yes or no questions. So it's going to be a question of, it would bother me if my significant other, and it's going to be, did certain things, okay? Now, I apologize to those of you who don't have a significant other. I still want to include you, so if you can just use your imagination um, to imagine if you had a significant other and they did this, how would you feel, okay? So they're going to be yes or no answers. Um, I want your gut reaction. I just want to take like five seconds and you just say the first thing that comes to your mind, yes or no, when you, when you read this. Um, and these are not trick questions. Even if you sort of hear it and you go, well, of course the answer would be yes, or of course the answer would be no. Just bear with me and, and go ahead and yell out the answer. So can you guys try, just yell yes or no, either one, and let me see if I can hear you. 
this is going to be this is going to be completion and I'll throw them up there and you yell out the answer whenever you whenever you figure it out okay all right so it would bother me if my significant other started a college fund at the birth of our child no. okay had a personal assistant to assist with purchases of clothing and accessories no. Yes. <laughs> okay, kind of mixed. I heard some no's and yeses. Um, had a family member who made fun of me for having a college degree. Yes. yes. Hired a plumber to do needed repair. No. no. <laughs> spent money on a personal tailor. Yes. <laughs> quit, quit jobs without having another because he or she didn't like the boss. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I heard some no's from that. Was organized, keeping a paper trail on everything. No. <laughs> Valued me largely for my social connections. Yeah. Okay. Cursed at his or her boss in public. Yes. Yeah. Spent evenings taking graduate courses. No. And somebody said yes, I think. Had family members. <laughs> Had family members who looked down on me because of my bloodline or pedigree or lack thereof. Yes. Okay. Um, didn't pay attention to time. For example, Miss Dates was extremely late and just didn't show up. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So that's the end of the pop quiz. And I wanted to get that out of the way before we get sort of into this material um, that I kind of want to address. And so I want to talk about students from generational poverty. There's this amazing book that I read several years ago that completely changed my perspective on a lot of issues, particularly why do these students behave like this in my class or why do they behave like this when they come into my office, that kind of thing. So I recommend everybody reads this book. It's Understanding and Engaging Under-Resourced College Students, A Fresh Look at the Influence of Economic Class on Teaching and Learning in Higher Ed. And so I emphasize under-resourced because that's sort of their catchphrase for talking about poverty. And so I want to ask you, and you guys can just yell this out because I can't call on anybody. Somebody tell me, you know, what your answer is if I say poverty is caused by, how would you complete that sentence? Lack of, lack of a job. Lack of a job? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I heard somebody say economic policies. Wrong place at the wrong time. Wrong place at the wrong time. Okay. Okay, those are all good. Okay, so I gave uh, when when I was dean, I gave faculty this quiz because I think sometimes people. Um, sort of attribute poverty many times to individual behaviors and that very much um, can play into it um, but I gave them this multiple choice quiz that poverty is caused by individual behaviors or exploitation or political economic structures so if I gave you that quiz what would you say? C. C? Okay. It turns out it's really all of the above and um, people sort of do tend to attribute either an all or nothing kind of a thing. Either some people see it as it's just totally individual behaviors. Some people see it as it's totally political and economic structures. But, you know, exploitation, I mean, what about these, you know, payday loans and these car title loans that exploit people who sort of are, you know, caught in the tyranny of the moment and, you know, they've got to survive today and that kind of thing. I mean, there are a lot, there's lots of that kinds of exploitation out there um, that, that contributes to poverty. So, so just to say it's a multifaceted problem, it's not just sort of one thing or the other. Then there are also two different kinds of poverty. Does anybody know what generational poverty is, the definition? Chronic. Chronic. Okay, that's a good, yeah, that's a good descriptor, chronic. So, so here's sort of an official definition that, that this book uses and that I've seen other places. Generational poverty is those who've been in poverty for two or more generations. Situational poverty is sort of like that's that wrong place at the wrong time and it's sort of a shorter time. Maybe they had a good job at one point and then something happened and then all of a sudden they're homeless and in poverty. So 
those are actually, I never realized that there were distinctions like that when you're talking about poverty, but with the next uh, things that I'm going to talk about, this really comes into play. So what I want you to focus on is generational poverty. That's what we're really talking about here um, on this next part. So when we talk about poverty and resource, keep in mind under resource, that's not just about not having enough money. It's it, There are a lot of other resources. And I want you to think of those as, when, when we say resources, it's quality of life indicators. And there are 11 that I want to kind of draw your attention to. There are financial resources, obviously. There's mental cognitive ability. There's emotional, physical, and spiritual states, all three of those. There's the motivation, persistence, integrity, and trust, um, language skills, relationships, and role models, and support systems. Now, that's only 10. And you may think, well, yeah, those are kind of obvious. That all makes sense. Okay, the last one is the one that really got my attention and really changed my perspective on everything when I read this book. It was called Knowledge of Hidden Rules. And I was like, hidden rules? What's that? I've never heard of that before. Um, may maybe you have and maybe you sort of know all about this, but I didn't. Um, so there are hidden rules of ethnic and racial groups, of the classroom, of sort of the institution, the college or university, of the discipline, the major field of study, um, and of economic class. And so um, I, I was fascinated by this whole idea. So hidden rules are unspoken understandings that cue the members of the particular group con concerning expectations and behaviors. They are cueing mechanisms that we don't deliberately teach not as parents, not as co you know, college professors or whatever. They're just modeled and implied. And um, it's important to remember, this is a bit of a caveat. I want to make sure you understand that I'm saying hidden rules are patterns. Patterns are not stereotypes because all patterns have exceptions. So if you use a pattern to prejudge an individual, then you're stereotyping. So that is not my intention here. So what I'm talking about is just sort of general patterns and there are always exceptions. So back to this idea about hidden rules, um, the people who know the hidden rules of a group or institution assume everyone should know them, right? I mean, knowing the hidden rules is often equated with not being intelligent or like, what's wrong with them? Why don't they understand they shouldn't be doing that? And man, how many times have I said that as a faculty member? Um, you know, about my students, you know, what's up with that? What are they thinking? I mean, I don't understand that at all. Um, so um, recognizing sort of the reality of hidden rules. Um, oh, okay. I've got okay. I've, I've got just a few more minutes. Um, so recognizing um, that they exist actually reduces judgmental and prejudicial attitudes, which is really important for faculty in the classroom and sort of all of us in general. And it turns out that faculty who know about the hidden rules of generational poverty are more likely to be successful in their teaching. So I want to talk about hidden rules of economic class. Um, and so driving forces um, for the different economic classes, for poverty, it's all about survival, relationships, and entertainment. And when you think about, when you kind of get this in perspective, and then I start thinking about my students whenever I was teaching, Man, it put a lot of stuff in, per in perspective for me, and it helped me to understand a lot. Um, middle class, the driving forces are work and achievement, which I could totally relate to, right? Um, wealth, it's about money, political, <clears throat> excuse me, and social connections. Um, when you think about hidden rules of economic class where money's concerned, for poverty, it's to be used or spent. For middle class, it's to be earned and managed. For well, wealthy people, it's to be conserved and invested. So that's a different perspective, right, for each of those classes. Um, food. For poverty, it's about quantity. Did you have enough? Um, middle class, it's about quality. Did you like it? And wealth, it's about presentation. Did it look good? Um, and so time, um, for people in poverty, the present, present is most important, and the decisions that they make are based on sort of surviving. I've got to survive today. Middle class, the future is most important, and that's how they make decisions. For wealthy people, traditions and past history are more important, and their decisions are often based on that. 
So now I want to go back to the pop quiz results because this is hopefully where it will kind of pull it together and put it in perspective. So these were items from a self-inventory that were sort of to provide you a sense of how strongly you identify with an economic class based on what triggers positive and negative reactions. And you all answered, most of you answered exactly like I did on every question. And that's why I picked these. There were a lot more that I could have picked from, um, but I picked these. So um, the ones that were, um, it would bother me if my significant other started a college fund, hired a plumber, was organized, or spent evenings taking graduate courses. I think all of you guys, on almost all of those, it was like, would it bother me? No, it would not bother me. Well, that's the hidden rules of middle class. And what I found myself answering on all the inventory questions on middle class, they were all the same. It was like, no, that wouldn't bother me. Okay, the next group, the personal assistant, personal tailor, social connections, you know, okay. members of the family look down on me because I don't have a certain pedigree. Well, probably, obviously, that's hidden rules of wealth. Now, again, some people said yes or no on some of these, and so, you know, there is some crossover. This is not stereotyping people. Um, the last one had family members who made fun of me for having a college degree, quit jobs without another job because they didn't like their boss, cursed as their boss in public, and then were always late and that kind of thing. That's hidden rules of poverty. So what helped me was understanding um, where these students from generational poverty were coming from that were in my classroom that I was dealing with um, and even other people that I deal with you know in the business world or whatever um, really helped me to um, put things in perspective and it's important to remember that the hidden rules of the middle class have been normalized as the dominant culture of the United States and and well and I was going to tell you about a kind of monopoly game example I'll skip that but basically these hidden rules govern most institutions schools agencies and businesses and so what we end up with is sort of this institutionalized racism or in the case of like you know I was talking about CEOs and big corporations and that sort of thing in the in the business world um, you know institutionalized sort of sexism when it's sort of the you know the white guy system um, women don't necessarily, the rules aren't really made with women in mind. So it's a systemic issue. Um, and awareness is crucial. There's a lot left to do with regard to racial and, and gender issues. There are these hidden rules and this whole issue of cultural competency. And it's really up to us to help educate our peers and, and encourage these kinds of converse, conversations. So I think everybody ought to read this book. It's a great book. Um, and I'd be happy if you had questions or whatever, be happy to have you email me. We have a reception upstairs that will give talks to people, but even so, uh, we have a few minutes if people want to comment or questions to the speakers. Yeah. I'd like to just make a comment. Uh, I, um, at least some of you know that there was uh, a uh, presentation up in uh, Toronto at York University with Florey's uh, and Jim was supposed to put these. And the one thing that, that was done there that it had, I, had ne I had never seen anybody write about was really talk about who we was outside of mathematics and outside of the things that we all know about and about what happened at uh, these job firings. And in a, very quickly, the head of the Canadian Communist Party was there speaking, the head of the Cuba Friendship, Cuba Canada Friendship uh, Society was speaking, and that was all very important to me. And it really shaped who he was in terms of what he believed and how he should act towards people. And um, as I say, it, it's missing. Even I wrote something for the AWM newsletter. I didn't mention it. Um, and, uh, you know, he was a communist through and through, and he was proud of it up to the very end. He was going to do the party, and he cared. And I think that people should know that. Thanks, Judy. I have uh, Martin Marlon sent me the video of that. And again, yeah. if, if someone wants to, I can make it. Yeah, I have the, if, I, I have the, the, uh, the uh, Link to it. Uh -huh. I, don't, I don't have the DVD. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I can speak to it. Oh, yeah. uh, since I had the uh, privilege of being there. Um, uh, she, she was on the video. She's yeah. on the program. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Y
uh, there were about 150 people there, and it was a very long uh, session. It began at 1 o'clock, and the first two hours were in a separate room than the bigger reception. And that uh, there were six people, each one of whom gave a very deep uh, mathematical paper uh, on mathematics that was related to the kind of mathematics that we did. And Martin Muldoon uh, spoke there. Uh, and uh, if you want to know about that, that was, uh, Jim, that would have uh, answered. Uh, it would have spoken to me very much to do that. And then the other session began at 3 and was it ended about 6.30 or 7 uh, because there were many speakers. Um, and it's all on tape. It's two hours uh, on the uh, video. And um, Judy mentioned the uh, head of the Congress Party in Canada. But also um, people, and I, I don't have the title straight in my head, maybe you do, of uh, being like AAUP, American Association. Oh, yeah, it was the, the Canadian, Canadian, Canadian uh, Union. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and other organizations uh, have it um, that he spoke with. And there had been uh, a previous uh, memorial. Uh, gathering from the uh, of the um, society and also the Jewish society. And yeah, I don't that group. I don't know, but it's, it's a it's very a active group, group. and they have had uh, the world it's on top. Let's see, it's like hey, it's it's taking up issues mm -hmm. and then uh, dealing with it. And then uh, reference was made, and uh, one of you made that earlier to. Um, his particular interest in Paul Robeson and Pete uh, Seeger. And somebody sang, and Mary could tell you what it was that the woman sang, because uh, it's, it's, that was for the uh, It's the uh, slave chorus from the Buka, it's the chorus of the Hebrew slave, which has always been a uh, miracle to me that it's, you know, it's a chorus of the slave. Why does everybody sing it as a freedom song? It's, it's sung as a freedom song in Italy, and it's also sung elsewhere. So, and whenever it's whenever that opera's done at the Mayo, they sing through the chorus of the Hebrew slaves, and then they they stop and they sing it through again, and that's the only time that ever does on course. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and that was because of these particular appreciation of um, all the things that we've talked about here. They have an enormous display of many many posters of uh, print material related to the uh, activities that have been referred to here. About Lee, and it was the first time I had ever seen the letter that Einstein wrote uh, supporting his uh, situation when uh, over Stuyvesant. Uh, he was in his jobs, he was in the department. Um, and his whole family was there, including his uh, grandchildren. So, yeah. uh, anyway, you enjoy seeing the tape if you'll give me the reference. I'll, I'll wrap yours in a second. I just want to say. Uh, in, in reference to what Judy said, I, I, we, also, we also got a, uh, I didn't get it directly, but someone sent a, 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 the obituary to J.P. Kahan, the great harmonic oh, analyst, yes. who was also a French, in France. It's in French, but mostly someone also sent a translation. Yeah. I have a different one to see that. Yeah, that's easily available online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, Kahan was, I, well, I knew someone in France. So. But I also want to just say, I won't read them, but I just want to say, who oh, I got messages from, in addition to those, you know, Mary mentioned Chandler Davis, but Ray Johnson, Idris Asani, Diane Lyson, Martin Davis, uh, 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 well, uh, Michael Messner, Evelyn Floyd Granville, uh, Rhonda Hughes, and, uh, and Sylvia Bosman, all, 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 all sent messages, and I can show you some of them. Yes, my name is Colin O'Kay from Stormont College. I'm delighted to see that Evelyn Boyd Randall was mentioned. When uh, Lee came to Stormont many times over the decades, and he was always hugely popular with the students, I'm proud to say that Stormont gave both Lee and Evelyn Boyd Randall honorary degrees. But he was a huge influence on Ada Faulkner, who rebuilt the math program in Stormont and has built, you know, had an enormous influence on, on women, African American women participation in math over the years. I want to see in 10, 20, 30 years young people asking who was Lee Lowe. And I can make a very small suggestion as to how we, we here can have an impact on that. Outside this window, there's a room of breaks at the MA sponsors. 
Um, there's a brick out there for Edit Faulkner, and I'm hoping people will ask the question who is Edit Faulkner and look her up on the internet. We could have a brick too for Evan Boyd Grant, and especially for the George. So if people are interested, maybe some can consider. Thank you. Uh -huh. Are there any other uh, 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 questions or comments? Michael, where's the reception? Uh, upstairs. This building, okay. just up the stairs. Well, okay, so see you all upstairs. Thank you. Thank you.